Okay, today we have a congressman from California, Ro Khanna. Thanks so much for coming on. Brian, thanks for having me. I want to dive into something that I think we can all agree is having the most impact on Americans. So this entire episode is dedicated to Dr. Seuss. So have at it. <laughs> I, I do want to talk about uh, an issue that I actually think is the most important issue facing us right now, and that's the issue of the uh, $15 minimum wage. So. As of this recording, the Senate just failed to reach the 60 vote threshold that's required to overrule the parliamentarian uh, and, and include a $15 minimum wage in the COVID relief package. So in your opinion, um, as we move forward, what's the likelihood that we'll see uh, the passage of a $15 minimum wage? Well, it's less today. I, I think that the Senate parliamentarian should have been overruled so that the minimum wage could have been part of the COVID package. That would have had the best chance of getting people to a yes. And even if we hadn't gotten $15, it would have forced a compromise at $12 or $13 uh, had that been included. Now the challenge is you're going to need 60 votes. You're not going to be able to get it through 50 votes. Uh, and uh, Romney, people say, well, what about Romney? Well, he's got 10 bucks, which is wholly inadequate, but it's got a poison pill with it. Uh, he has a, a, a provision that you have to have e-verify on small businesses. Well, the Democrats aren't going to to go for that kind of uh, a policy. They vote, we voted against it all the time. But here's the irony: e-verify. It's not going to mean that undocumented suddenly leave America. It's going to push them in the shadows. What does that mean? They're going to have less bargaining power. What does that mean? It's going to depress wages. So uh, there's no way we can uh, do that. So the question then, I guess, for the administration is how. What's their path of getting an increase? What a lot of people, myself included, don't seem to understand is how Democrats are so willing to allow themselves to be hamstrung by a procedural issue like the parliamentarian, which, by the way, is only an advisory uh, opinion. Like, we have a thousand miles of road in front of us, but we get to a perfectly passable speed bump and kind of give up. Exactly. And then they say, well, the votes aren't there. Well, you have to create the momentum for the votes. The votes won't be there if you don't uh, lead. Let me give you an example. I mean, the votes in the Senate early on were for less than a trillion dollar bill. Right. And uh, they had all these bipartisan groups. And then President Biden, to his credit, showed leadership. He said, no, we need to do one point nine trillion. And that's where uh, the conversation shifted. So my view is if the White House had overturned the parliamentarian and said, no, we have to deliver a wage. In candor, we may not have gotten the $15 that uh, we need, but we would have at least gotten $12, $13. And that's what's unfortunate. Now, even to get $12, $13, I think is going to be a huge lift. That's a good segue into uh, the reporting that, that, that I've seen that you were part of a group chat that formed to pressure Biden on this issue. So what was the outcome and, and what strategy do you intend to take here? Well, we were, uh, some of us were chatting late into the night, Rashida Tlaib, Jamal Bowman, myself, uh, Mondeer Jones, Marie Newman. And we said, we've got to do a letter to the White House, to President Biden and Vice President Harris saying, don't let this parliamentarian ruling stand because reconciliation is actually our best bet uh, to increase the wage. And unfortunately, uh, they, they didn't take the advice, but I should think they'll be pleased that we put that letter on the record because it at least sets the precedent that you can do a minimum wage increase in a future reconciliation that you don't have to just defer to a parliamentarian. And I don't see many ways that they're going to get a significant wage increase if they don't do it through reconciliation. Right. Well, uh, unless, of course, uh, the other option is the uh, is nuking the filibuster. So um, that's a good segue into sure. that issue. And, and, and I spoke about this uh, this issue last week in my interview with Elizabeth Warren. But uh, with the filibuster, yeah, like, I enjoyed I, it. That I, was a great interview. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I didn't intend and I don't intend for that to be a one time subject because I do think that the elimination of the filibuster is the single most important issue that we're facing right now. Like that will fundamentally change uh, uh, the future of this country. So I know that it's uh, easy for certain moderate Democrats um, to say that they won't eliminate the filibuster in the abstract. But in your opinion, once it becomes a choice between protecting this obscure procedural tool in the Senate and allowing yourself to literally get legislated out of government or passing legislation that just delivers fairness, do you think that we'll see a reversal from the Joe Manchins and Kirsten Cinemas out there? I don't know. I can't predict their votes, but I can tell you what gives yeah. us the best chance uh, to be able to do it. First, we have to uh, help educate the country on the history of the filibuster. I mean, President Obama has called it a relic of Jim Crow. Adam Jettelson has a brilliant book out 
where he explains that it was not Madison or Jefferson who came up with a filibuster. It was Calhoun to protect the interests of slave states. And what has been the biggest use of the filibuster? To protect uh, states uh, uh, who were fighting against civil rights reforms. So the history of the filibuster is tied with race. And I don't think many Americans, I didn't appreciate that until I read uh, Jettleson's book. And we have to do that public education. Second, I think we have to link votes on minimum wage increase, on voting rights, have that vote and right away have a vote on, do you wanna eliminate the filibuster? So people see the link. Okay, yeah. uh, they're not voting for minimum wage. And the reason I'm not getting it, with, even though 52 people are for it, is because of the uh, filibuster. And I, I think we have to get people to realize it's not just procedural. But you're absolutely right that this is the biggest institutional reform. Just to hammer the point again about why we asked uh, the White House to overturn the parliamentarian, if we're not willing to overturn the filibuster, which is the right reform and, and the heaviest lift, and we're not even willing to overturn the bird rule, which is an easier lift, but something that we should do. It's actually the least path of resistance to say, well, we're not going to accept the parliamentarian's interpretation of the bird rule. And the administration isn't even willing to do that. So the, the point is, at some point, we have to have institutional reform. Yeah. And, and by the way, this isn't just, for example, uh, tying the $15 minimum wage to the filibuster. This isn't just smart economics. It's also going into a midterm where history tells us there's going to be a swing to the right and needing something to show voters. And I, I can promise you that uh, a $15 minimum wage or passage of HR1 is going to work a hell of a lot better than telling voters that you preserve the integrity of the Senate filibuster. Yeah, absolutely right. Now, look, there are a lot of good things in the COVID relief. We're going to get checks to people. We're going to help uh, fight the child poverty uh, with child tax credits. We're going to help fund vaccinations. But I think what is missing is the type of structural reform that minimum wage increases would have been. It wouldn't have just been a one time check. It would have said, we understand economic inequality is a huge deal. We understand you can't be paid two dollars and 13 cents as a tipped worker, where there are about five million tipped workers who make less than five bucks an hour. And we understand that's the reason you came to the polls and we're going to change your life forever by taking the action we did. That is what's gonna get turned out because you're absolutely right. The Republican base is gonna turn out in 2022. A lot of the folks who have the crazy conspiracy theories who think that the country is being taken over, they're all gonna turn out. And our challenge is, is our base going to turn out? They're not gonna go vote for Republicans, but they may say, is it worth it to get out? And we have to give them that motivation. Right, right. And I think that there would be uh, there, there'd be no more, nothing more tangible than a wage increase that's so popular that it ran like, what, 15 points ahead of uh, ahead of Joe Biden in Florida. Um, it's passing in, in otherwise, you know, red states. And so uh, so I think this would be something that would be really easy and really popular to pass. So uh, so hopefully they stay on it and uh, hopefully the pressure stays on so that we can actually uh, see some see some movement on this issue. Absolutely. Well, we're not going to back down and neither are the advocacy groups. And Reverend Barber uh, uh, from the Poor People's Campaign has just been such an eloquent voice. I mean, he said this is a racial justice issue. This is an economic justice issue. This is the moment. And he, I talked to him on the phone a couple uh, about a week ago, and he said that Dr. King in 1963, when you had the March on Washington, it wasn't just about racial justice. It was about a two dollar minimum wage. It turns out that $2 back then would be equivalent to $17 today. And so yeah. we've been fighting for this for uh, as a nation for 50 years. And it's 2021. And we still haven't implemented what Dr. King was calling for in 1963. So I think that the profound consequences of a dignified wage uh, are not understood yet in, in uh, Washington. Yeah. And, and by the way, do you know of any lobbying efforts that are do being done behind the scenes for the more moderate Democrats who, who currently stand in opposition to both, you know, um, the issue of the $15 minimum wage or the filibuster more broadly? I think it's generally just the chambers of commerce and the uh, economic uh, thinking that somehow this is going to be anti-business. This is going to hurt small business and this perpetual fear that the Democrats shouldn't be painted as an anti-business party. And we're not. But this is not going to hurt business. Let me give you a very concrete example. When Senator Sanders and I 
introduced the Stop Bezos Act. And we said that uh, Amazon should be taxed if they aren't paying their workers a $15 wage because basically they're footing uh, taxpayers with the bill on all the public benefits. People said, right. this is terrible economics. What are you doing? You can't force Amazon to do that. Three weeks later, Amazon raises their wage. The economists cried, oh, this is going to lead to mass automation. This is going to hurt their profits. Guess what? They've added 100,000 jobs since they went to $15. They have yeah. become more profitable. They're a trillion dollar market cap. So at some point, evidence needs to matter. And there's these tired thinking, the same thinking that this is somehow going to hurt business, which isn't true. And I tell people it's not just the special interests. It's actually more pernicious. I wish it was just the special interests and the lobbyists. What's more pernicious is it's an economic worldview that has seeped into uh, conventional thinking of uh, staff members, of think tanks that basically have defined wage increases as anti-business. And we have to yeah. take on more than special interests. We have to take on this entire ideology that is actually divorced from reality. And by the way, all you have to do quite simply is look at places where there already is a $15 minimum wage and the cost of their goods is the same exact cost as in places where there isn't a $15 minimum wage. I know there was some, uh, there was something going around on Twitter uh, a few months back where someone was saying, oh, well, wait and see uh, the cost of a taco at Taco Bell. It's going to be, everyone's going to be paying $38 per taco once you raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. And you look in a place like Washington, D.C., where there's already a $15 minimum wage and the cost of a taco at Taco Bell is the exact same as the cost of a taco anywhere else in this country. Brian, you're right. And, and the other thing I don't understand is when people say, well, do it regionally. Are you really telling me that someone, if they're working in my district in California for Taco Bell or in Washington, D.C. for Taco Bell, they should be getting 15 bucks. But if they're working in another part of the country in a red state uh, and doing the same exact job, they should be getting 10 bucks. How yeah. is that fair? How is that equal? How is that honoring uh, the dignity of people in uh, red states or, uh, or rural communities? Uh, people should be getting paid the same amount for the same job, regardless of where they are. And so right. we can have a $15 floor. Now, some places which are higher cost of living like mine can have a higher uh, threshold, uh, but there should be a floor at $15, uh, which is 80%, less than 80% of the median wage. And at that level, that's what's considered reasonable by the economists. So I do want to uh, to move over, and I know we touched on this at the beginning, but uh, you know we 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 started the interview kind of joking around about Dr. Seuss. But in all honesty, does the cancel culture grievance on the right work? Like, is it effective? Because my channel, my podcast are are largely predicated on countering right wing disinformation. So I, I right. watch a lot a lot of Fox News. Too much, too much. Any any amount of Fox News is too much Fox News. But I watch a lot of Fox News, and even I can't wrap my head around how a family of four in West Virginia trying to make ends meet is going to turn on the TV and see Jim Jordan complaining uh, about cancel culture and be like, that's my guy. He speaks for me. We can't let the radical liberal silence us on Twitter. <laughs> you know, like I, I, I'm, I'm being flippant about this, but honestly, does that resonate with people on the right? Well, I think what uh, concerns people uh, across the country is this sense that we're all speaking in echo chambers and we're not uh, speaking to each other. And uh, there's a, uh, uh, there's this goes both ways, right? I mean, they, they, the right was perfectly willing to, to quote unquote, cancel Colin Kaepernick. I mean, they didn't have a problem uh, saying that he shouldn't be allowed to have his expression. So the, the, the question is, how do we get beyond this? Now, I got uh, some criticism, but I actually, I went on, uh, Ben Shapiro, Shapiro's, mm -hmm. uh, Shapiro's podcast, and we had a civil exchange on that issue of the minimum wage. And I guess what I would say is that all of us need to have uh, not stray from our convictions, not stray from uh, what we believe, but we do need to try to reach out to uh, other platforms and make our case so that uh, we are engaged in some kind of a uh, reasonable exchange. And that to me, if we don't do that, I think we're going to continue to to polarize this country. That's a great point. I think that's a, a good place to, to stop. So Congressman, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate your podcast.